Hi there, I'm Bryn. This is Heather. Hi. And this is Scott. My friend Scott's an amazing preceptor. I had him years ago. We won't go into how long ago, but um, <laughs> we are bringing him on today just to kind of give you guys exposure to what a medical science liaison would do. So MSL work is something we, I guess, I, we didn't really have exposure to no, that in pharmacy school. One of the many school. things we did not get exposed to in school. So hopefully we can learn a few different things on your path. We'll try a few things. <laughs> But yeah, he had a lot of, how many years? 10 years at the VA? Ended up with 11 by the time it was all settled okay. and I was out of there. So 11 years in the VA as a pharmacist, mainly awesome. doing pain management and hospice and geriatrics. And that's when, of course, yes. you had the misfortune of rotating with me. <laughs> yeah. uh, it so it's that. a small world. We always tell every, all our students that we talk to, like, it's pharmacy is a small world. So there's like, I don't know, three, eight, 20 levels of connection or something. So, so the connection, Absolutely. I know you... I just recognized you from UF when we were all yeah. in school and stuff. And then I met your wife through residency stuff that we do together. And then how do you know Scott? From the preceptor stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He always uh, had great advice for making your presentations funny. <laughs> There's got to be some sort of like inside joke or outward joke. Like it keeps people's attention. We do a lot of precepts. So I, I precepted a lot of students there. So uh, I believe it was for eight years. Wow. I was taking eight to 10 students a year. And then was one of the main preceptors of the PGY-1 program. So had all six to seven of those residents for at least a couple months a year. And then I created my own PGY-2 and ran it for six years. And it was the fourth accredited program for pain and palliative care in the country. Um, which bizarrely, the two were in Florida and two were in Maryland uh, as far as ASHP was concerned. And then uh, that was uh, another one that was hard to give up when I left the VA. So question on that, like starting <laughs> at the VA, <clears throat> how did you get your position at the VA? Okay. So like a lot of people, I think I went into pharmacy school thinking, you know, knowing about community pharmacy and wanting to consider that, um, started rotations. First one was the VA and it was, uh, had a good preceptor, but we had some miscommunication in my first three days on the, in, in the field, in the rotation, I had no preceptor. Mm. And, uh, so learned a lot on the fly and, and had some had some fun with that and realized immediately how how much the medical team there leaned on the pharmacist and mm -hmm. uh, that became almost instantaneously something that I realized I wanted to do was to be that integral part of the team where the doctors diagnosed and the pharmacist prescribed more uh, where it was mm. they have hypertension Scott what drug fits into their profile that would work well for this patient's hypertension be it race, uh, other disease states, comorbidities, you know, what was our ACE inhibitor of choice, those kind of things. And so uh, really like that, felt it was being a bigger part of a team. And uh, so then decided immediately I wanted to try to do a residency there. And so came back into the residency. And at that time, uh, you could early commit to the PGY-1 because the geriatrics program at the VA was considered a PGY-2, but they didn't get any PGY-2 applicants like ever. And so they were able to do that and early commit. So I was actually able to early commit to the VA uh, to do a residency. And um, residency did a lot of different things. It was considered geriatrics, but you did uh, home-based primary care. You did uh, geriatric primary care. You did long-term care in a nursing home. You did a month of hospice, which when they covered that, I said, that's going to suck, but it's only a month. I can get through it. <laughs> and then found out that's actually what I really love doing. Nice. Um, it's funny how that happens. Yeah. And so... Uh, I just found that that one, a lot of the times, it was the people whose you know, bodies were failing, but their minds weren't. And so there's a lot mm -hmm. of the attitude of, um, you just told me I've got three months, so I got to get home. Like, there's fish to catch, mm -hmm. or I got to mow my yard. Like, I, I want to get out of here and do this. And uh, I, like, I enjoyed that mindset and making a difference. Uh, later, I also liked it because it was not an algorithm based anything. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of big time studies in it. We would use meds off label for things. And so. We kind of, it was a lot more artistry than just follow an algorithm like you did if it was just blood pressure and you know, this is what we do. Um, <clears throat> so actually when I finished the residency though, you don't always get your dream job when you finish residency. So there were no openings. So I staffed for six months um, in the VA just doing outpatient pharmacy. And then they said, uh, you know, Susie's going to leave. I know you did that. Would you be interested in filling in? And I was, yes, yes absolutely, absolutely yes. I'll fill in. <laughs> uh, knowing I wanted to keep the job and do it. And uh, so that was... For the next 10 years, uh, wow. working that. And so I did not know it at the time, but I they had actually only opened the palliative care unit uh, a couple months before I rotated through there. And so I didn't realize that I was kind of getting in on the ground level of it, but um, had anywhere from six to eight bed hospice unit, 
12 to 16 beds going as long-term care and then another 12 to 15 beds that were gym unit, uh, which is a geriatric physical rehab. So we had a lot of people that were large wound healing, uh, post amputation gait training, um, stroke uh, recovery. It was pretty much their last effort. If they kind of failed there, we would try to tune them up and get them back home. And if they couldn't survive there and, and do solo, then they would end up going to a nursing home. So it was like our mm-hmm. last ditch to where we could have, you know, twice a day PT, occupational therapy, dietary, social work. We had pharmacy there to trim the meds and get everything done and everybody had to get everything lined up and say, all right, here's your last chance to see if we can get you home and let you live at home for a while longer. Um, so we did that for, for 10 years and uh, thought that was what I was going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and then industry calls. <laughs> I went to the dark side. Yeah, so, so how did that happen? Yeah, it's just out of the blue. Was or? not was not looking. Uh, in fact, uh, it was funny. Today, Facebook came up and said, you know, this memory. And it was uh, six years ago today that I actually announced that I was going to be leaving the VA. Um, wow. And so... Uh, timing is strange uh, with that. <laughs> but, well, happy today. anniversary. Yeah. Um, I had an, an old colleague uh, contact me and ask if I was interested in, in leaving. And at first I thought they were asking if I had any of my PGY2 grads uh, interested in the job. And I said, well, you know, I've got a couple here. I think they would be good. I know one of them's not going to want to leave. She's definitely going to be VA. And they're like, well, actually, we were thinking more about you. Uh, and that took me by surprise. <clears throat> but talked about it, talked it over with the uh, wife and... Uh, we decided we needed to, to make a make a jump that was probably the best chance I had to, to do this with someone I knew, so I wasn't making a blind leap. Mm. And my joke is that after 10 years in the federal service, very little difference from being in a groove and being in a rut. Uh, a lot of the, the jokes they make <laughs> about the inefficiencies in the red tape are true. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a good chance. I had a very good student. Uh, Shelly Spradley coming up that was a PGY2 resident so I could get her into my seat. She rocks. Shout out to (laughs) Shelly. And so I wasn't going to leave my team in the lurch uh, when I was leaving them uh, because I'm still tight with several of the people on that team, uh, our attending physician and and some of those. Um, So it was kind of the perfect opportunity. So I decided to to make the leap uh, and also get more money. Uh, Can't leave that out. Um, To do a medical science liaison, which was at first with not with traditional pharma, but with a, a laboratory company. And so because of my experience with pain uh, and experience with public speaking, uh, was a lot of what the job entailed, uh, it was for a lab company that did urine, urine toxicology and some pharmacogenetic testing. And so uh, mm. at that time, the job was to um, usually go out and, and let, I would lead a dinner program where I would go talk to an insurance, an insurance group, present to them some data about why they wanted should cover the urine drug testing, why they should cover pharmacogenetic testing, what the benefits were, and try to get them to cover the services. Uh, I've talked a lot with doctors and answered the questions, so I joke now that I, my job is I'm the opener. Uh, <laughs> the salespeople are the closers; they get to do that. Uh, I don't. I, I can't. I could not be a salesperson uh, at all. So you come in with a top hat and a cane. I do. I, I open the show, and then they come in and close. Um, I joke with them that uh, sales salespeople can go two for ten and go home and celebrate the two wins. I would go home and drown my sorrows for the eight, eight no's. So it's like I can't do it. Can't do that. Not doing sales. Not for um, Can't do it. So that was how I got into the the medical science liaison. That's interesting you say that because I was, you know, you think sales, that that's what you are. And, you know, I'm, my benign little naive little brain is that, you know, you're a salesperson. It's sometimes tough to draw the line. I mean, you can think of it as I'm selling the science, um, mm-hmm. but the FDA has a lot of laws to uh, separate the medical affairs side from the commercial and uh, promotional side. And so none of my compensation can be accounted for with, with, with sales as far as the territory I cover. If it gets an increase in sales, it doesn't matter to me. Um, a lot of the sales stuff is hidden from us. We're not supposed to know about it or care about it. <clears throat> Obviously, I need my company to do well, so I continue to have a job. Mm. But uh, nothing with sales actually comes across there. And even the doctors don't know that sometimes. They'll say, oh, yeah, I'm not using your product. I'm like, I, I have no idea. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you are or not. I'm not here to talk about how much you're writing or not writing mm. or whatever. I want to talk to you in general more stuff about you know attitudes mm. with, with, uh, with, with pain management or in that case with, with the lab testing and how we're doing and what we're doing with that. I think that's key because I think mm-hmm. a lot of people think that if you're so are you a, a drug rep is that term like not what you are correct that's not what okay. i am so usually uh most people understand being in medical affairs and then that side mm-hmm. of it as far as the medical science liaison because it's, that's not a word we use a lot i have to look it up i, I think the first year i had to, i had to <laughs> double check how to spell liaison i was like how do i, spell I told her it, it has like four eyes in yeah, it it's like, like two, what is you don't this? have enough eyes then you pull my business card and check to see how to spell <laughs> liaison <laughs> 
I feel so much better. Yeah, I was like no, practicing announcing it. Like, that's why you lay 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 so I didn't know when I even got the job how to, how to spell it or what what exactly it would entail. <laughs> Oh my goodness! So yeah, yeah. First job actually, they, they didn't use the liaison word. They did. Uh, I was associate director of medical affairs. So okay. all, the, all well, these companies crazy. have a medical affairs uh, part and division. And so, uh, where were that? So, so it seems to me like you had kind of made your brand, if as it were, in that kind of hospice palliative care world. You had kind of made a name for yourself. Because I think and our done audience, yeah, and done presentations. So I do get asked how how do you get a job like this in industry, and you can chase it. And I know people that have come out with a. It's usually for a medical science liaison, you have to have an advanced degree. It's usually a PhD, a PharmD, or an MD. Uh, it can be ARMP as well. I've seen a few uh, worked with a few that are ARMPs that are MSLs, um, but you have to have this advanced degree. You either can chase it, and if they need somebody that's fresh, but most of the most all of the you know, job flyers will say need two years of experience in this particular field or whatever. So they're looking mm -hmm. for a cardiology one and they want someone with cardiology experience. Um, the other way to do it is to go and do your thing, become an expert in your field and, and then they'll come to you. Um, which for me was pain management mainly. Uh, that's because of my work with pain management <clears throat> in hospice. I got to know a few of the people also that are doing the same kind of thing. And mm -hmm. you know, we've done lectures at conferences together. You know, I used to do, uh, do ACAP lectures here for Lafayette County Association Pharmacists. So I would do NCFSHP and those type of things. And so they knew that I was someone that did not have a fear of public speaking and speaking out in group and doing these things right. and had presentation skills. And they weren't going to have to train me on that. And so that's how they actually came to me is because they, I, you know, I was, I was, I was an educator in this field and had presentation skills. And so they, they came to me on that one. So that's the other way you can, you can do it. It's just the longer, harder route. And if you don't know that's what you want to do, then mm -hmm. that's, kind of what you end up doing and being in the right place at the right moment 100 like, yeah 100 being in the right place at the right mm -hmm. time I, I i knowing now i probably would have actually chased it because i really like what i do uh, and i'll do it as long as my wife will allow me to <laughs> because a couple nights a week usually she's a solo parent because yeah. i'm i'm on the road so that's the downside of it but uh so what's the good side like what's the good side of it? oh i love the flexibility and the freedom of it uh, i get to for the most part set my own schedule okay. uh, i mean i do have conferences and things i have to attend or company meetings but um Kind of everything sounds a little bit different metrics and how the job is measured. For me, I, I maintain a relationship with approximately 30 opinion leaders, so thought leaders. I spread them around my territory, which, again, the bigger company, you're going to have smaller territory. Smaller company, a big territory. So my territory is four states. So wow. I cover Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Okay. And so I have physicians and pharmacists and mid-levels throughout that area that I will meet with quarterly. Um, update them on what our company's doing and then get their, you know, feel on how their practice is going, how they see the practice evolving, uh, you know, general environmental things. Is there anything, you know, it, what would be optimal, you know, way a company could help you out, um, you know, and then if we need uh, an advisory board or if we need someone to do a speaker program and, and do that, then I've got, you know, relationships built here where I can contact them and do this. If we would like to do research, a lot of times docs want to do research. And so they'll say, keep me in mind if you have any research. So then I've got, you know, this book, a book of people that I can say, all right, well, this person I know wants to work with us. They'd be a good fit for that. So I have a whole variety of academic people and then in the trenches providers. So I can kind of keep a finger on the pulse and I know, all right, this is how docs in Louisiana are feeling squeezed by the local environment for pain management. So I can mm. keep tabs on that for my company in the same token. I can also with these physicians, they can say, you know, what they're dealing with. And I can say, well, you're not alone. This is Alabama was doing the same thing. This is what they did to fix that. This is something that I'm seeing, you know, physicians other places do and can help facilitate some relationships even with, within my, my physicians to help them work things out. If there's, you know, legislative action in one state and another state might not know about it and can say, well, this is what's going on in Florida. I can put you in touch with a physician that helped orchestrate this. And so I've done that a few times where then they start talking and, you know, build, help them build some professional relationships. I just try to be a facilitator for, for these things. And so <clears throat> that's, you know, very difficult to measure objectively yeah. how MSL brings value to a company. And it's often a, a tough thing to do. Um, so the only thing you can do is continue to, to be out there and doing things and have these relationships to be able to build upon um, because it's very easy to judge a sales rep if their sales are up or down, how it's going. But for an MSL, you're out there seeing people like mm -hmm. there's no, there's no objective measure and the FDA won't even allow it to be an objective measure. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it, Difficult there. So sometimes, uh, and what is a lesson learned is you have to, in the VA you get by by keeping your head down and doing your job. 
that's not how you get by yeah, an industry. You have to, like, you have to wave your flag. Hello. Yeah. And so that's actually why I end up, that's really the biggest reason I lost the first job and then end up, end up in the current job is because I was used to head down and do my work. And then so when there was layoffs in the company, it was, you know, what have you done for me lately? And I didn't have anything special to show. Mm-hmm. Um, I did anything wrong. My bosses actually recommended me and got me the interview the second job and they were fine with it. They were, you know, this is what happens in industry. That's the downside. VA, very stable. Mm-hmm. Industry, not so much. I mean, average... Average employment at most for, for reps or for MSL is about three years at a company. Wow. wow. That's about all the average is. Because when the product goes away, then you, you're Sometimes. So, yes, it can always, it can do that. There's there's a life cycle of a product I've learned where, you know, you can get from launch to this. And so unless your company's doing this uh, and, and buying new products or getting new things out there, there can be a loss of, of, you know, need for you because once the insurance companies have all dealt with it, they don't need you doing that part of it. Once the reps have been out for two or three years promoting it, the docs no longer have questions for it. It's kind of been settled where it is in therapy. And so you kind of need this to, to go along and do it, or you need to try and climb the ladder a little bit and, and do some of these things with, on a corporate level and, and do that. So it's interesting. So when folks are considering an MSL type position, are they wanting to also look like their pipeline or like what else a company may have? Or? It certainly would help. Um, that is, that's, you know, can be the issue when you have a very large company. So I know okay. I've talked to MSLs with large companies where I have four states, they may have Jacksonville. Oh, okay. and they'll have to have X number of physicians or providers that they keep relationships with, you know, in that small area, which is very nice for travel wise. You're just bouncing <laughs> yeah. back and forth over there. But, you know, it's difficult. You don't get to pick and choose as much. You've got a much smaller pool to choose from. And I think the same thing would be is if you only had one product, um, you know, there it may be around for a while. But the, the need for you to be around for a large team is going to diminish as the mm. product has a, again, it has a place set in therapy and, and you know, Again, it becomes a mature product is kind of how they would, would discuss it and say it's become a mature product and no one's asking questions about it. No insurances are dealing with it and changing formulary mm-hmm. status for it. And so another question that I just thought of, when you're preparing for like talking with these docs and it's awesome that you're this resource and this connection, how much studying do you have to invest? It's like you have these many doctors to meet <coughs> with a month, but are you also having to like set aside time to like... Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's still some of that. Obviously, you have to know all of our products backwards and forwards. I have to know most of the competitors backwards mm. and forwards, know what's in the PI, what's not. Mm. There's still a lot of legality with that. So the sales and promotional team is never allowed to go off-label. They can only speak on-label. I am allowed to go off-label, but I'm not allowed to solicit off-label questions. I'm not allowed to lead mm. the discussion that way. That's a fine distinction that I had to learn about uh, that I wasn't aware of. Um, so I always joke with physicians because a lot of times they don't even know. And I'll say, I'm like a vampire. You have to invite me in. <laughs> so I can talk about anything, but you have to lead the discussion I that way. I like that quote. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the way it has to be. They don't know. There's a lot of strange rules that you have to familiarize yourself with. The, the other one that's even more bizarre is I'll go to conferences to meet physicians, to stay up to date with things. I just was at a, a nice conference this past week. Unless we have a separate booth for medical affairs, mm-hmm. I'm not allowed to hold a discussion with a provider in the vicinity of promotional materials. So if a physician comes by the booth that we have marketing people at or sales rep at ask a question, I have to take them outside the exhibit hall to talk to them. Interesting. Very strange. And so usually the way we have to do that is <laughs> the reps will have my cell number. Like, we have a doctor with a question. I'll come by. How nice to meet you. Do you have a question? Okay, well, let's go outside and we can discuss it. And they're <laughs> What do you mean we're going to go outside? Is it, did I ask the wrong question? Is this going to become physical? What's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> and I have to explain, no, this is just FDA. I'm not allowed to have a scientific discussion with promotional materials around. Like it's that bizarre. So is that new? That's or part what of, happened that's, to make that? Well, Why that, is there a distinction? When there was the Wild West Pharma right. in the 90s, right. like when we used to go to conferences yeah, and come home with buckets and, of stuff, yeah. <laughs> all that's gone. And that's, this is actually this... With the, I, would, I would consider this some of this overreach in as far mm-hmm. as what, where it is with that. Um, there's also a lot of rules that are written and sometimes can be interpreted differently. But, um, for instance, I can actually go out in the field with a rep. I could actually have an introductory meeting. A rep could introduce me to a physician. Um, if the discussion gets off-label, the rep actually has to leave. Mm-hmm. Like, they aren't allowed to ha- you know, even be in the room when this discussion is supposed to happen. Wow. You know, it's it can be tricky because that would look like they're promoting potentially off label. Okay. Well, they could be um, soliciting an off label question. Yeah. Some companies won't even allow medical liaison to be in the field with a rep at all. Mm-hmm. I've talked to reps with my company that were very pleased that I was actually going to work with them and you know get yeah. keep them in the loop because previous companies were just no, there's yeah, lines. They like, them. they didn't even like 
know who their MSO was or could call them, they would submit, they call it a MRF, a medical information request form. And, you know, we still do those, but my reps always will call me and go, hey, I'm submitting this MRF, you know, if you want to call this doc and discuss the answer when we get it, and we'll get a written response to them, and I can call in and talk to them. But. So I have a question. <clears throat> no, no, you go. Um, so, so if a pharmacist is out there, and they're an expert in oncology, and they're like, you know, I think I could speak to people. I've got an outgoing personality, and I know this stuff forward and backward. I am the expert people come to for questions in my facility, and they know some drug mm -hmm. reps, and they're thinking about pursuing that. Um, you know, the, I think the question might be, okay, I know my field, and I know sure. the information, and I know, like, the history and everything, but I don't know how to do an ML, MSL job. Is there training that you go through that they teach you all that? Like what you need to do, how the conversations go? Like, do they train you in that? There are some trainings. I think um, most of them it would be a company. I think there's just so many right ways to do it. Um, there is now a board certification. Um, I'm not that familiar with it. I see the advertisement before they send me. They send me <laughs> stuff on it for this being board certified in medical affairs. Ah, um, I haven't addressed I've seen it. That too. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure what what they're doing there. For the most part, I believe the companies will probably do the training because everybody's gonna be a little bit different on how they want the metrics done and how they get, how your performance is gonna be measured, which is always the number one thing you should ask in a job is how are you measuring my performance? Mm. I want to be sure I can actually do that. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so for us, uh, you know, I got hired, and both companies I've worked for have brought in. Uh, people to help teach us better presentation skills, better mm -hmm. ways to manage conversations and, and leading difficult conversations, uh, better ways to you know initiate relationships with uh, colleagues and providers. And so they'll often have these. There's companies that actually specialize in in training uh, people how to how to speak and how to do these things. So there is some of that. Um, but as far as just exactly how to do an MSL job, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that does just a. Because if they think, well, I'm a great, oh, I'm a great expert, but I don't know if I could do this job. Like, I don't know how I would even go in and talk to a doctor or like what would be expected of me. Sometimes you feel like you're asking for a date. It's, <laughs> it's awkward. It's awkward. Yes. So. And it's, it's one of the toughest things that I've dealt with. And I know some of my colleagues because I always try to mentor new hires. Saying, do you have a mentor? Uh, I have a mentor. Was my old boss that had to let me go. <laughs> He's the guy that serves as my mentor. Hey. But I try no to mentor him. But there's a lot of times that I, I think of it going in there. Like, what am I bringing to this provider that would make them want to give me time. Yeah. Because when I was a busy clinician, I was like, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Right. <laughs> you know. Because it so, seems to me you're going to have to show your value to that doctor. Yeah, what uh, every, you know. Every, like you every know a short amount of time. Yeah. Every meeting you're going to have to come in there and, and show some value. If you, if you, you know, request a meeting and he's going to give you time and then you have nothing, then you risk damaging that relationship where he's going, yeah, next, next time. So I always do try to have something. And so like what Mike Amadeus usually does is every quarter we're going to have some new question we're going to ask some new resource we're going to be mm. talking about so we have at least Something one new thing to, to bring in there but normally mm. it's you know you're not going to be good at building relationships if you're the one always talking mm. it's you've got to listen and oh, so absolutely it's a lot of it is you know Being kind of knowing listener. what's in the area and then trying to get them started and to talk and then if you can listen to them then they'll usually okay well, now what do you want to talk about but it, it's getting it, through the gatekeepers I found is really tough too. <clears throat> it's like you just don't go on and like here's their email like they make oh, yeah, sure no, come on in. There, there is a lot of things with that and it's <clears throat> even still uh, you know this is definitely it's always a work in progress. I mm -hmm. always joke with people like I, I'm not ashamed to say I'm good at something. I'm good at this. Doesn't mean I'm not every day trying to get better and still getting yes. messed with and, and have problems with it. I I, I had even a doc I'd met with twice. I emailed him. I'm going to be, this is in, in the, the boonies north of Huntsville, Alabama. And I was like, I'm going to be in town this week. Can we come by and see you? Absolutely come by at one. We'll sit and chat. Perfect. Get to his office, check in with the front desk staff. I'm like, all right, just have a seat there. And then waited and waited and waited. And about 90 minutes later, they brought in, like there were four other reps out there and brought them all in. And he... The, the staff didn't know I was different and I had an appointment oh. to see him and he saw me with the reps and he's like, oh, well, I need to see you in the room and we can talk high level and then came out and did the rep stuff. But it was just miscommunication where I didn't know what was expected of me there. I mean, the guy was fully ready to meet with me and do everything. It's just the staff didn't have it. So gatekeepers can definitely play, play a role. A lot of times it's just getting to respond to you because they get so many emails. Mm -hmm. Like I've, I asked them, all right, what's your what's the preferred method? And, you know, I try to get a cell number if I can, so I can just text them. Mm -hmm. I know they're, I know they're going to get it. Then it's like a kind of spam filter. But if I get an email, a lot of times I'll say, what subject line can I use that will catch your attention? Mm -hmm. oh, because 
I, right. I'll sit there sometimes and have the whole email typed out. I'm like, all right, what do I put in the subject? <laughs> Yeah. What can I call this? Mm-hmm. That they'll actually have him look at it and respond to it because you get a lot of no responses. Yeah. So uh, in that case, you know, sometimes I can utilize the sales team and say, "Hey, is this guy on vacation? Have you <laughs> seen him recently? You know, could you could you ask him? Hey, hey, is he, have you talked to Scott lately? And yeah. See if he <laughs> triggers anything. Um, and then sometimes they completely forget. I mean, I've been stood up for lunch dates and stood up for you know afternoon things where. Fly into town, rent a car, oh. you know, drive an hour and get there. And they're like, I'm sorry, the doc left. And I'm like, well, I had an appointment with him 20 minutes from now. And they're like, he left for the day. And I'm like, all right. Oh. So that's where it's helpful that I get to set my list because if the doc does that to me a couple times, then I'm just going to go find another doctor that right. can be in my opinion. Like, I don't have anybody that's that must-see for me that I have to. Whereas on the sales side, you have to. Yeah. And so they have to, they'll, they'll take it and deal with it. I'm, I, I need I need to have a you know variety of docs, right. but there, there's I have I don't have anybody that that's special that I can't be replaced if right. if they you know don't my joke with them is like you need two things to be an opinion leader for me I need access and I need an opinion that's it <laughs> it's that easy <laughs> even if it's negative I have had docs be like yeah I'm not a big fan of your products you probably don't want to talk to me I'm like no actually I want to talk to you more I would love to sit down dinner and yeah, talk what, about it and what's your you know we'll talk yeah where's the issue here with what you guys are doing what's your view on the mm. the environment as a whole like you know. What, what, what do you like? Teach me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so and so it sounds like um, for a typical day, it's all what you plan or it's more like month <laughs> so to month? I don't have a typical day. I would have a typical week okay. um, usually. So like I said, I have four states that I haven't spread over. I do try to cluster them so I can mm. bundle them together into one trip. Um, but basically, so every quarter I'll have to do a couple of days in New Orleans and catch New Orleans and Biloxi, a couple of days in Huntsville and catch that surrounding area. So all over my territory. Um, so usually three days in the field a week. Okay. Uh, usually that means being gone two nights. Okay. But then if it's hit my Jacksonville docks or my Tampa docks, I may not be gone at all. I may be able to drive over there, mm-hmm. see a couple, come home, and then the, another day later that week, drive over and see the other one. So uh, I do get some weeks to do it. Mm-hmm. So the flexibility of no one will schedule it. So if I know I've got a first day of kindergarten for my oldest daughter coming up, <laughs> I know I'm not going to be gone. Like I can schedule around it. And when they were babies, it was like, if I was going to be home and was sick, then I could, you know, go to the dock and do that stuff. And it allows me freedom to go work out when I want to on the days that I'm home. Now, granted, So you work at home the other days? Yeah, my other two days are home days. And so, I mean, there's a lot of it that is unpacking from the last trip and packing for the next trip. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, expense reports and getting that done. And, and there's plenty of, like, stuff to do. And then catch up on readings. We talked about staying up abreast with what's on, what's going on in the field and, and legislatively and things like that. So there's a lot of things to do. But, yeah, they're, they're home days. And so mm-hmm. it's... Um, I love being able to reset mm-hmm. by having some alone time at home and be like, all right, this is it. This is recharge and then uh, get back at it again usually the next week. So Wow. So typically Monday through Friday is when any of your Yes, trips so fall. really, yeah, I don't have anything yeah. else with that. Uh, if you take a vacation, you just take a week off? Or? Yeah, I can take whatever I want yeah. off uh, with that and, and be gone. I still would be expected to. Uh, see, still see my 30 that quarter. Okay. Um, so it would be difficult if I took a month off, but... Um, to do that, but as long as you can hit that, then you're fine. You take vacation whenever you want and do that stuff. The only time I ever do weekends is a conference. Mm-hmm. So I was at the Florida Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, and it was a Thursday through Sunday conference. So I was there for that. But you know, I was, did not work. I worked at home. Well, I didn't work. I worked at home <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday went down and did that. And I'm at home today, tomorrow, and then I'll hit the road again on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So. Interesting. So our big question we ask everybody. Yes. Our self care. What do you do for your self care? So how do you fill your cup back up? <laughs> I do a lot of fitness <clears throat> stuff, uh, exercise, and those things. So doing a CrossFit, not 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 fully into the cult, but uh, <laughs> he's doing a lot the of cult. CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> so about twice a week CrossFit, and we've been doing that for about five years. And then always been a runner, uh, and then recently added last year added swimming, and then I'm about to add some biking. Um, so try to do some triathlons. We gotta. Peloton uh, last year, and that was uh, a, a great big step. And my wife loves it. Mm-hmm. I like it. I ride it, and so I'm getting some of the cycling muscles going, but not the uh, not the balance and those other things that you really need to to yeah. go and ride. So doing speed a lot of that. is your friend when you're oh, clipped yeah. in. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Slow, slowing down so is like do that. And then with two kids and everything, I love to cook. And so usually if I'm if I'm home, I'm the one doing the cooking. So I do that. Uh, so I love doing the, the cooking side of that and playing with them. So that's. Uh, that's usually what fills my cup up now mm-hmm. is, is doing that kind of stuff. That's cool. Are you still doing your gardening stuff? Don't garden as much. So I used to live out in the country, as it brings hinting <laughs> at. Uh, 
and uh, had had five acres out in Lachua. But uh, last, well, now two years ago, we moved into into, into Gainesville, so no uh, no gardening at the time, and been. Uh, he would it's schmooze a, all the nurses. He'd oh, come yeah. in with like zucchini baskets. And <laughs> Absolutely. It <was> awesome. <laughs> a lot of doors you can open with fresh vegetables. <laughs> with some zucchini. But no, unfortunately, I don't get to do that anymore as much. Uh, it's, it's hard when you're traveling to take I, care I of all that. I really couldn't. Like, like I couldn't leave it uh, on my wife to do that when I was gone. And even then, I, I actually was still living there and doing it when I first got the medical affairs job. And we oh, didn't have a family yet. But I, you know, it was fine in May and early part of June, but then in July, if you miss two days and come back, the weeds are now taller than your plants. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing how that happens. It, 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 that's what that's what happens. So. Also, I fall in the trap uh, that you the older, the, the older you get and the, the more well off you are, the more you find a reason for some, pay someone else to do your work for you. <laughs> so now you know I have somebody that does a lawn, so I have more time to spend with family. That's been another change with it is oh, that I used to do yeah. a lot of side trips and do everything else and yeah. you know, all get her football and everything else. Now I get back in the road. I'm like, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to be home. Right. And so it's cut down on some of that, but uh, still just Your value set just changes. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. think that happens to all of us. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Awesome. Well, I wish you the best. you have a date Thank for you. your triathlon or... Uh, I, I, I haven't paid <laughs> it yet, the but there is a, there's a nice one at Camp Landing in a month. Oh, nice. Oh, a month. A month. Wow. Do it. Aggressive. Well, Arr. it's it's a sprint length, so it's short. So it's like a five or 600 meter swim, a 10K bike, 5K run. You got it. So I, that I can handle. You could do that. I mean, nice. I might be a little saddle sore the next day, but I can handle it. <laughs> that's awesome. So. That's cool. That's very cool. That's well, what's going on with me. Yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, I think mm-hmm. you speak a lot to our audience that's going to be curious about how you got it. And even our students of like, how could they break into that world? So thank you so much. Absolutely. It's very interesting. Yes. Just remember, it's a small world. <laughs> yes. I, I get asked a lot about residencies because I was a residency director. And the advice I would give all the students for that is that every day on rotations is a job interview because we all know each other. Yes. We will call. We will email. <laughs> We'll know how you did on rotations. Yeah. Yes. And you even talked about off off camera, um, like even if you're not one of the people that you use your letters of recommendation and they see you oh, yeah. on the <laughs> on the previous rotation list, they can reach out and, and ask about you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, but thank you so much. Absolutely. It's great. I'm Brad. Glad for having me on. Yeah. Thank you. This is Scott. This I'm is Heather. Heather. We're pharmacists out of the box and we hope you enjoyed today's show. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you next time. <laughs>